Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge that the Chow Chak Wing Museum and the University of Sydney more broadly, more broadly is built upon the grounds of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The museum and the university pays our respect to the traditional owners, and we acknowledge elders past, present, and emerging. My name's Craig Barker. I'm the head of public engagement for the Chow Chak Wing Museum, and it is a great privilege to welcome you this afternoon for the first of a week-long series of lunchtime talks, um, the first series that the Chow Chak Wing has hosted, hopefully the first of many lunchtime series talks. But uh, what's lovely is that this week, of course, is National Archaeology Week. It is uh, an annual celebration in the third week of May each year in which we acknowledge the work that's being done across Australia by Australian archaeologists, both here at home and also, as you'll see in the series of talks, um, or most of the talks this week, um, abroad as well. There's a long tradition of Australian archaeologists working around the globe, and indeed this particular museum has been the recipient of many of the uh, uh, material culture uh, finds from various excavations in various parts of the world. To find out more about not just our series of talks, but also uh, other events taking place around Australia, visit the website archaeologyweek.org. Um, there's something to cover all interests, as long as you're interested in archaeology, I guess. Um, but anyway, tonight is my, oh, tonight, this afternoon is my great privilege to welcome Dr. Stavros Paspalas to kick off the series. Stavros is a great friend and supporter of the uh, of the museum and um, it's great to actually have him as the first in the series as well. Stavros is director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, um, based out of here at the University of Sydney, but again, um, very heavily connected with a whole series of Australian educational institutions. And of course, uh, the home of um, all Australian archaeological and historical work in Greece. Uh, Stavros uh, also is a co-director of the Zagora Archaeological Project, which is what we'll he hear about this afternoon, but has also worked at the University of Sydney's excavations at Tironi, and in addition at the Kifara Archaeological Survey Project for a number of years. His research interests include the Greek world's link with Lydia and further east, and uh, he also has a particularly strong scholarly interest in the archaeology of the Northern Aegean during the Archaic and Classical periods, and now, as we'll see today, in the early Iron Age Aegean. So, Stavros, thank you very much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stavros Paspalos. Thank you, Craig, and, and thank you, everybody, for, t for turning up. Let me work out, the, remember the mechanics of this. Zagora is located on the island of Andros, the most northerly of the Cyclades, a group of islands which the ancients envisaged as forming a circle around the holy island of Delos. The site holds an important, that is Zagora, holds an important position on a maritime route between those islands and the large island of Euboea, which hugs the eastern coast of the Greek mainland. Effectively, Andros's bays are the last port of call before ships sailing from the east face some of the most dangerous waters on the Aegean at the straits between Andros and Euboea, and the same holds for ships going um, in the opposite direction. Before turning to the site itself, I'll just say a few words about the island. It is one of the most well-watered and fertile of the Cyclades, with many natural springs and its relatively high relief, its highest mountain is just shy of a thousand meters, captures moisture as well, importantly offering various climatic niches which could be exploited for different agricultural and pastoral purposes. The site is slightly south of the center of the west coast of the island and it looks across to the other islands such as Syros, Yaros, Kea, and Kithnos, and to the north towards Euboea, and on clear days one can see further yet. And I will just point out that I'm, conv I'm convinced that from the eastern coast of the island, 
looking across the Aegean, um, I could see Chios on one occasion, which is the island. Where's the cursor? Ah. Wrong. Which is this island over here. And locals tell me that's that it is definitely the case. And in, 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 apparently in past generations, it was even more common to be able to see across um, the, the Aegean. Whoops, yeah. We may well be forgiven for thinking that the founders of this settlement chose this particular location because it offered relatively easy access to the maritime network which linked these islands and, on a wider scale, continental Greece, including Attica and the eastern Aegean. It is by no means a matter of chance that all the known large ancient settlement sites on Andros are located on this coast. Hypsili, which is the northernmost point on the map, a site which is contemporary with Zagora. Then the long-lived Paleopolis, the next site south, um, which ran through the late geometric through into um, the late antique period. So that was the center of the island during the archaic and classical and Hellenistic and Roman periods. Then Strophilus, one further down, uh, goes back all the way to the late Neolithic. Vrokastro, early Bronze Age and Plaka, Middle Bronze Age. So all the known major sites are on this side of the island. This is not to say that occupation throughout antiquity was limited to this coastal strip. And to restrict ourselves to the early Iron Age, the period which interests us today, the find of a complete small crater, in all likelihood from a burial from, the, from Amonaclio in the Corthi Valley, which is the area circled, strongly suggests that other areas of Andros also saw intensive human activities. And there are scatters of early Iron Age uh, sherds found at Gavrio in the north, and at Paliopolis, as I said earlier, and then Zagora and Ipsili, which were major centers. <coughs> and I suspect in all these historical periods, the choice of this coast um, is inexorably linked to the sea lanes to which it was directly connected. And along sea lanes, of course, both humans and goods traveled. Zagora is important as it is a well-preserved settlement of the 9th and 8th centuries BC, a time that is also known as the geometric period, as so much of its pottery and other artifacts are decorated with geometric-based designs, as on these from Zagora and, of course, the monumental Athenian crater in the Nicholson collection, which had been made to be used as a high-status grave marker in Athens. This is a critical period in Greek and wider Mediterranean history, as it was then that we can start to trace the processes which led to the development of the social and political structures of the archaic and classical periods. Though we should never forget that the people who actually lived at the times didn't see their lives as such, they just led them. It was generally in this period that links with the Eastern Mediterranean intensified after a lull which followed the Mycenaean palatial collapse a few centuries earlier. It was in this period also that the Greek alphabet was developed on the basis of Eastern prototypes, that tales crystallized into the Homeric epics that we know as the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that Greeks established their first overseas foundations, settlements which we conventionally refer to as colonies. In short, the horizons of the Greek world were expanding, and some would argue that the interconnectivity between various settlements of the Aegean and other Greek lands forged the sense of wider Greekness, or at least its beginnings. So the site represents a crucially important period. Furthermore, it offers us information from a nearly unique vantage point. Most of the archaeological information we possess on the 9th and 8th centuries derives either from funerary or sanctuary contexts. Extensive areas of early Iron Age settlements that can be excavated are very rare, for the simple reason that most lie under the remains of later buildings if they haven't been totally destroyed by them. For instance, Athens was definitely occupied during these centuries, but very little is known of its domestic arrangements. Very few traces of houses have been excavated, and we know more about where people lived and worked by use and refuse deposits in wells rather than the actual domestic contexts. 
Zagora offers us a near unique opportunity to explore an extensively preserved settlement of the period, for it was abandoned in about 700 BC and effectively it was never reoccupied, so preserving its remains. This, though, does not mean that it was forgotten. Far from it. As we shall see, the settlement sanctuary was revered for centuries after the last occupants left. Of course, one of the corollaries of the break in habitation means that the name of the settlement is unknown. It was not preserved, and the name of Zagora may only be of a few centuries vintage. The ruins of the town were never totally covered. There wasn't, for instance, any huge amount of silt washed down to cover the walls of houses and other structures. The locals always knew of Zagora's existence. The site was first documented in the 19th century when it was recorded that the locals considered it haunted, though that did not stop it being used both for cultivation and for the grazing of animals. In the late 19th century, a number of pottery vessels that had purportedly been found in illegally excavated graves on the hillside west of the site were turned over to the authorities. The earliest of these date to the 10th century. Attempts to find the location of these graves have not proved particularly successful, though our recent survey and thermal photography campaigns have provided some hints as to where others may be located. As you have seen, Zagora sits atop a high, rather stubby peninsula that is connected to the isthmus by is collected to the island by an isthmus. This headland or peninsula is comprised of a series of alternating level layers of schist and poor quality marble, the topmost layer being of marble. This stone, this marble, and an incredibly huge amount of schist brought in from the surrounding countryside were the main materials from which, this, from which the structures at Zagora were built. The peninsula does not have a source of water, and hydrologists tell us that it would not have had in the past either. There are a good number of springs in the immediate vicinity, on the hill flanks to the west, the closest about 400 odd metres distant from the isthmus. This spring may well have been the settlement's main source of water, though we should keep in mind that seismic activity may have affected the nat natural springs in the area. We should also keep in mind that the Zagoreans may have stored water that ran off the flat roofs of their houses, either in large clay vessels or in natural cavities in the marble bedrock where it could be held for a while. The first excavations were conducted as part of an exploratory campaign at the site in 1960 by Nikolaos Zafiropoulos of the Greek Archaeological Service, who worked at the site only for a two-week period. In 1967, Alexander Kambitoglou from the University of Sydney initiated systematic excavations under the auspices of the Athens Archaeological Society, which lasted through to 1974. The Kambitoglou campaigns revealed extensive parts of the 1.7 hectare site and resulted in a number of publications and more are under preparation. In 2012, an Australian team returned to Zagora under the co-directorship of Professor Margaret Miller, Dr. Leslie Beaumont, both of this university, and myself. And a few years later, Dr. Paul Donnelly of the Chao Chak Wing Museum joined us as a co-director. And I must stress, that what I present here is a distillation of work undertaken by scores of specialists, students and volunteers. The discovery of Zagora is truly a multi-generational multi -generational and collaborative project. As you can see from the plan, approximately only 10% of the site has been excavated. Zagora still has much to offer and it will continue to do so well past our lifetimes. And I should point out that the antiquities are those uh, elements which are shown in the darker, um, where's my cursor here, in darker black, like these collection of houses, and this here, and these areas. The areas in red 
um, are those that have been excavated since 2012. Um, and mo more, most importantly, you'll see that there are a number of walls, long walls in, in light gray that cut across the site. When we're thinking of the past, the, uh, antiquity, disregard those. These are field walls, which could be anything from 100 to 800 years old, if not older. They, they don't relate to the early Iron Age settlement. So, what have the excavations revealed? In short, the remains of a flourishing town of the 9th and 8th centuries BC, though most of the standing architecture dates to the 8th. We can start with the fortification wall, which the inhabitants built to cut off the isthmus. As regards defensive pur purposes, the sheer cliffs around the rest of the settlement's perimeter were apparently deemed sufficient to deter any enemy encroachments. The wall, the fortification wall, probably dates back to the 9th century, and it actually was built in three distinct phases, as indicated in the section drawing. The entrance into Zahura was via a gate in the southeast section of the wall. This construction was clearly, the wall that is, was clearly an investment in time and effort. Fortification walls played various roles in antiquity. They most obviously offered protection against any potential hostile forces, but they also aided in forming a sense of community among the inhabitants of the settlement, which they enclosed. That is, they also had an ideological aspect. In time-honored tradition, the builders of this wall made sure that the gate, its most vulnerable point, was protected by a bastion. Any approaching ill-intentioned warrior, assuming most people of the day were right-handed, would hold his shield in his left hand, thus exposing his unprotected right side to enemy fire from the bastion. And, and you can see a reconstruction of the bastion here. Within the settlement, a number of houses built against the internal face of the fortification wall have been excavated. These are one or two room structures. More houses and more complex in form have been revealed on the higher ground to the west. As you will see from the plan, they are rather modular in nature. This has led some commentators to describe Zahora as a planned town, the creation of one master plan. We do not believe this to be the case. Rather, the urban structure or development of Zahora can be better described as agglutinative. Based on square or rectangular units, the houses could have rooms and courtyards added to them or decommissioned as the requirements of the household, that is the humans who actually resided in them, changed through time. This can be clearly seen in these examples from Area H, which were subject to significant alterations over the course of the second half of the 8th century. So we start with a plan on the top left, then you can see that two rooms were added here, and then this room here was decommissioned. In a later stage, more houses were decommissioned, and this room here was reconfigured. And then finally, even more rooms were added, more reconfiguration, and the more decommissioning of, of rooms. And here, the final stages of the western houses of that group um, can be seen in, in greater detail. Unlike the houses of many other early Iron Age settlements, though I underline again that rarely have as many and over such an extensive area been revealed, Zagora's houses are not upsidal or elliptical in form. That is, they do not have one or two curved ends. And I show examples of such houses from Oropos on the mainland coast opposite Eubea. The local building material at hand at Zagora, schist from the hillsides to the east and marble sourced on the headlands, favored ortho orthogonal constructions. And generally, rectilinear buildings seem to have been more common on the islands in this period. In addition to stone, timber was also required for important elements, primarily for columns, ceiling rafters, and lintels. This drawing by the late J.J. Coulton, the architect of the first Australian campaigns, uh, and whose drawings have done so much to enliven um, the settlement 
um, in, 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 the lit in the literature since the 1960s. So this, this one of his drawings, which I've shown today, shows a section through a notional house, um, and it provides a good representation of the basic elements. The ceiling of timbers were supported by wooden columns, now only testified to by their bases. Above the ceiling beams, there was a layer of flat schist stones, which was then capped by a layer of packed, waterproof clay and earth. This reconstruction is supported both by the excavated material as well as by a comparison with the ethnographic record. That is, oh, that's interesting. It's gone. For the ethnographic record. That is, the houses in Zagoras's region that had been built over the last few centuries, which are uh, a treasure trove of architectural information. You will note the drawing shows triangular-shaped windows. This is not a flight of fancy. Such a window was found preserved in a wall that had collapsed whole, so it just collapsed like that, and then waited to be uh, excavated a few millennia later. And such windows are also represented on broadly contemporary building models from Perajora and Argos in the Peloponnese. Though when we look at these models, we have to keep in mind that um, they did not have pitched roofs at Zagora, or the roofs um, were flat. Many of the rooms at Zagora are characterized by a recurring, recurring number of features. Firstly, all the houses, irrespective of size and complexity, had at least one room which was equipped with benches, the top surface of which carried a series of nest-like cavities. These were intended to support vessels of various sizes. The largest of these are termed pithoi, which were used for the storage of goods, and they typically could hold hundreds of litres and could be significantly taller than a fully grown human. And here I will open a parenthesis and focus on these pithoi for a moment. These were highly crafted vessels, which my colleague Beatrice McLaughlin has studied carefully. They divide into three categories distinguished on the basis of size, on shape, and the nature of the fabric from which they are made, and the firing regimes they were subject to in the kiln. Two of the categories belong to a local potting tradition, identifiable in the local course and cooking ways. Beatrice McLaughlin suggests that owing to the physical properties of these two categories, they may have been intended to store firstly oil and pulses, or short-term water or wine, and secondly cereals. The third category, it's the category on the right, is different. This third group of pithoi is elaborately decorated, sometimes with rich figural scenes, and they belong to a potting tradition that can be traced on the islands of Tinos, Kea, and Eubea, and in the mainland regions of Boeotia and Attica, as well as on Andros. It is clear that they were made by traveling potters who worked a circuit during the latter part of the 8th century. These pithoi are best suited to storing wine. The benches in which these pithoi and other vessels were placed were necessary at Zahora because the inhabitants could not normally dig into the ground to place their large storage jars as was common practice elsewhere. Given that the marble bedrock is only a few centimeters below um, the surface at most places. So, owing to geological circumstances and the requirements involved in the storage of agricultural products, the Zagoreans had to innovate in their architectural design. Close of parenthesis on the pithoi. In addition to these benches and column bases, major rooms could also have a, store a stone defined approximately square half near the central point, and more erratically, stone line bins. The floors of the rooms were comprised of packed earth. Our more recent excavations have confirmed the findings from the Kambitoglu led campaigns as regards the construction of the houses. One novelty, though, is that we may have excavated the first freestanding house at the very south of the site. This is not totally certain, but as yet we have not as traced any adjoining units. Interestingly, the northern room of this house clearly shows how the people lived with natural bedrock when it was deemed too onerous to remove it, as we can see in this reconstruction, a feature that is not unknown to those who study traditional architecture of more recent centuries in the Greek world. 
The settlement sanctuary occupied one of the highest points of the site. Today, and indeed from the 6th century BC, so uh, a, f a fair few centuries after the abandonment of the town, this uh, position in the site was dominated, the sanctuary was dominated by a two-chambered temple. However, this was not always the case. There we are. Kambidiglu argued that during the period in which Zagora operated as a living town, the sanctuary was open to the air. There was a packed surface layer and an altar, but little else structurally that has left an archaeological imprint. The preserved altar has not been excavated, so we cannot say anything regarding its history other than it sits on an artificially prepared surface laid in the 8th century. And I show a plan of the temple which encloses the off-centre altar. When the town was abandoned, Zagora, especially the sanctuary, was, as I noted earlier, not forgotten. We assume that its inhabitants, or at least some of them, moved to the site of Paliopolis, a few kilometres to the north, which, as I said earlier, became the centre of the city-state of Andros. Nonetheless, Zagora clearly must have retained some attraction, and some people felt that it was to their advantage to maintain links with it, and indeed to invest time and resources in the sanctuary. It may be that the abandoned town retained some cultural capital, a degree of historical cachet, possibly based on family links, or those who were still interested in it may have been motivated more by staking their claim to any economic resources, primarily agricultural, that its area possessed. Either way, the sanctuary was visited throughout the 7th century and in the second quarter of the 6th century, a temple, the remains of which we see today, was constructed, and it continued in use to approximately the latter part of the 5th century and I show a model of what the temple probably looked like. Furthermore, when the temple was built, the dilapidated gateway in the fortification wall was refurbished. While we can't be certain from where worshippers came, we could imagine them congregating at the gate and then making their way in a procession up to the temple through the, stand, through the standing and falling ruins of the erstwhile town. But can we say anything about the deity or deities worshipped at the sanctuary? Possibly we can, but the relevant evidence all post-dates by a considerable margin the period during which Zagora operated as a settlement. The earlier excavations uncovered a small number of items which may throw light on who was worshipped here, at least in the archaic and classical periods. The first of these artefacts is a fragmentarily preserved plaque which shows a striding figure with an upraised arm that could be restored as brandishing a spear. If so, the figure would reflect the military connotations clearly apparent in the representation of a plaque on the actual plaque, which definitely pictures a warrior who carries a shield and spears. Can we say anything further about the main figure? Well, given the artistic conventions of the period, the fact that the garment the figure wears descends all the way to the ankles is a strong indication, but not definitive, that a female is meant, and if she is standing in an offensive position, weapon raised, then we could think of Athena. Secondly, a plainware lecony, that's the archaeologist's term for a shallow bowl, very possibly part of the equipment of the sanctuary that dates to the second half of the 6th century, carries an inscription that may be read as poli, which, some would argue, could be an abbreviation of the term polias, the feminine form of an epithet shared by Zeus and Athena, which underlines their roles as the deities most concerned with overseeing the operations and well-being of Greek civic bodies. The most readily interpretable evidence that bears on the identity of the deity honoured at Zagora's sanctuary, though, comes in the form of a cantharos, which is a fancy cup, which dates to the second half of the 5th century BC. Very conveniently, its underside bears the graffito Herakleos, in other words, of Heracles, or, to paraphrase, this belongs to Heracles. Of course, 
Heracles was Athena's most famous protege, so we could once more see a link to Athena in this inscription. On balance, it is reasonable to suggest that the cumulative evidence may be interpreted as indicating that Athena was worshipped here in the archaic and classical periods, alongside, at least in the 5th century, her favourite, Heracles. But let's return to the geometric period town, three odd centuries earlier. In addition to revealing some more domestic structures, our recent campaigns have also excavated part of what must be a workshop or an industrial installation located towards the fortification wall. The single room building, which we've designated E4, dates to the second half of the 8th century, and it is not as carefully built as the other structures on the settlement. Within it, there is a clay-lined installation of, as yet, unidentified uh, purpose, and in the opposite corner, heavy deposits of ash. Pounders and pestles were also found in the room. Outside, we uncovered a unique feature at the site, a stone-lined channel which must have carried water. Just to the northwest, we opened another trench and found a small part of the room, also datable to the late 8th century. Significant amounts of slag, the refuse of metallurgical activities, were found in this room, and targeted testing of two spots within it traced a great amount of hammer scale, that is iron oxides, which are the byproduct of iron smithing. And just to orient you, where's the cursor? Here we are. Um, this is actually the, the entranceway, the threshold into the room. Um, and this is remain, what remains of one of the door jams and the targeted excavation um, were in these two squares. And it was on here that um, uh, sampling produced the hammer scale. So it appears that we have under, uncovered a part of the site which housed industrial activities. And while we can be certain of metallurgy taking place here, we are still to determine what was actually done in room E4, though there is still some of it to be excavated. However, these finds of 2014 and 2019 weren't the first evidence found at the site for industrial activities. Earlier, we had excavated a natural limestone depression used as a garbage dump a few metres within the gate of the fortification wall. The upper levels of this pit's fill, and you can see it's a very substantial pit, contained pottery of the first half of the 8th century, and lower fields date back into the 9th. The fill itself consisted of various categories of refuse, including pottery sherds, animal horns and bones, shell, obsidian flakes, a small number of bronze objects, and, in the lower levels, slag and modelled clay installation fragments at various stages of vitrification. These fragments are yet to be studied, but they testify to some sort of manufacturing processes that required pyrotechnological activity. To this point, I have focused mainly on what we know of the site in the latter part of the 8th and as regards the sanctuary in still later centuries. What do we know of the first half of the 8th century and even earlier of the 9th? The nature of the recovered evidence is different. We do not have preserved domestic contexts that date to this earlier period. Rather, material, mostly pottery fragments, have been found in secondary deposits, such as fill under the later houses intended to level building surf surfaces. There are, though, some primary deposits, but they are mostly from refuse pits. One of these is the pits to which I just referred. Another refuse pit, excavated in 2019, lies to the southwest of the workshop installation. A third is a dump that included pottery and workshop waste that was found between the first and second exterior phases of the fortification wall. All this material is particularly fragmentary, though it does have a great deal of information which it can impart. Our knowledge of 9th and early 8th century Zagora is pra practically dependent on the pottery finds. Firstly, though, a quick word as regards the study of pottery from archaeological sites. Why bother? Well, it is undoubtedly the category of artefacts that is preserved in the greatest quantity, as short of purposely grinding it down to dust, it survives, 
albeit very often in fragments. A great deal of information can be learned from studying the many facets of excavated pottery, such as what was used where, in what numbers and relative proportions, and what that tells us about activities carried out in specific locations. Or how does the profile of pottery use change over time at a site? Or yet again, what does its production tell us about technical know-how of the period? In other words, ceramics, a fundamental component in the lives of the ancients, allows us to propose theories as to how many aspects of their lives were actually led. Furthermore, as ceramic styles change through time, we can use pottery to date deposits, buildings and other features. I shall present a very small selection of the ceramics, mainly fine wares, in order to offer you an outline of Zagora's place in the wider world. The pottery assemblage at Zagora was excavated from different types of contexts at various points of the site, including refuse deposits, that is garbage dumps, terracing fill and domestic floor deposits, thus accounting for the differences in the state of preservation of individual pieces. Ceramics from floor deposits are typically better preserved than those from fills and garbage dumps. The earliest securely dated material dates the 9th and into the early 8th centuries BC and is all fragmentary in nature. Stylistically, the material falls into two readily identifiable categories, the first deriving mainly from the neighbouring island of Euboea and the second from Attica, the area of Athens. The first of these stylistic categories is focused, as I said, on Euboea and the, and the northern Cyclades and is best testified to by finds made at the sites marked on the map, especially at Lefkandi on Euboea, where excavations have been conducted since the 60s. The fact that they are regularly found at all these sites on um, the map, alongside attic pots, not only allows chronological correlates to be established between the different sites, but the common ceramic profile shows how closely the region was interconnected. We can start to think along the lines of a cultural continuum. Returning to the pit near the gate, I show a selection of the attic pieces found within it. Towards the bottom, the finds date well into the 9th century. The contemporary Euboean and related sherds, and which are termed sub-proto-geometric by archaeologists, find parallels at numerous Euboean and, as I said, especially at Lefkandi and Eretria. The similar material is found further afield, indeed all the way to the Levant albeit in minimal numbers. For example, close stylistic parallels to Acanthros from Zagora on the right have been excavated at Tel Rehov in Israel alongside other pieces from Attica, testimony to trans-eastern Mediterranean contacts. The vessel shapes represented by the imported pieces, and I show a selection of early Iron Age shapes from Zagora and other sites, include cups of various forms amphorae, a range of jug types, craters, and pyxides, which served as boxes, uh, normally circular. They would have covered a range of purposes, but possibly the most appealing to the imagination of many today would have been the consumption of wine, centered on the use of craters, jugs, and cups. And this is undoubtedly true, though we should not be blind to their other uses as well. In the second half of the 8th century, Euboean and Attic imports remain dominant at the site, but other groups can now be identified. In this period, imported pottery from the Cyclades, that's the island's uh, group to which Andros belongs, such as these deep skiffoi, and more specifically, as illustrated by this amphora and these cups from the island of Paros, come to the fore. Attic imports can be represented by these two neck fragments, on the basis of details of form and proportions, these pieces belong to a specific subcategory of late 8th century neck amphorae, well testified to at Athens. As capacious vessels that could be relatively easily transported, they are closely as aligned to transport amphorae per se. And transport amphorae were used in the movement of all manner of goods, primarily by sea. The example on the screen was excavated at Pithecusae, an, at least in part, Euboean foundation off the western coast of Italy. 
At our site, transport and freight, including examples of this type, are of the greatest importance because they provide further insights into Zagoras's contacts beyond Andros, as a number of these amphrae, even at this early date, can be identified as having originated at specific localities, though it cannot be automatically assumed that they evince direct links between Zagora and their production centres. However, they do testify to the fact that it was exactly in this period, the latter part of the 8th century, that the intensification of the transport of goods by sea in the Aegean is traceable in the archaeological record. And Zagora can contribute to the examination of this important economic, and by extension social, development in very significant ways. I show one handle of such an amphora that made its way from Corinth to Zagora. It was found in the natural depression within the fortification gateway. I show a drawing of a more complete example slightly later in date from Corinth itself, and a neck and handle fragment of another example from Methoni, a contemporary manufacturing and trading center in the Thermaic Gulf, currently under excavation by Greek and American colleagues. Note that the Zagora example bears an approximately cruciform stamp, evidence of an early marking system aimed at regulating either the production of these large vessels or the trade of their contents. Indeed, it is one of the earliest such marks known, and as such, an important piece in the mosaic that anybody interested in early economic history will be intrigued by. However, it is not the only example of a transport amphora from the site that bears a graffito. I show two other pieces. The origins of neither has as yet been identified. Both, again, bear graffiti. One, three horizontal strokes, and the other a cross, which were applied prior to the firing of the vessel. Parallels for these particular forms of graffiti can be found, but more often than not, they were applied post-firing, as on these examples from Methoni. All these testify to the concern regarding aspects of identification and enumeration in systems of vessel production, trade and exchange, all activities which were intensifying in the last decades of the 8th century. To return, though, to the fine wares, such as the amphora neck fragments from Euboea that bear a characteristic decorative scheme, which was a Euboean hallmark that was adopted in the late 8th century by various production centres in Boeotia on the mainland and on a number of Cycladic islands. A well-preserved amphora from Zagora is a good example of the type. One find, an unassuming handle and body fragment of a greyware drinking vessel, takes us in a totally different direction, all the way to the northeastern Aegean. It finds good parallels among material excavated on the island of Lesbos, as well as at Troy and Assos in northwestern Anatolia, and it derives from this region. This fineware drinking vessel testifies, importantly, to the Zagoraeans' linkage into networks that reached out to the northern Aegean. They participated in an exchange network which is testified to a greater scale at Methoni, the site on the Macedonian coast I referred to earlier. This conclusion regarding the northern Aegean was reinforced by the excavation in 2014 of a grey word transport amphora in the southernmost building excavated at the site, which is a very early example of a class manufactured in the northeast Aegean. This is not the only material from the northern Aegean that has been recognised at Zahora. Another comes in the form of a small bronze jugglet that was found in the settlement sanctuary area and which derives from the northwestern Aegean. However, its greater relevance is that it fits into a wider regional distribution pattern of such pieces, most evident in the neighbourhood at the sanctuary of Plakari, just to the southwest of modern Karistos in southern Euboea. Here too, a Macedonian bronze, though of a different form, was dedicated to the presiding deity. And it may well be that our jug found its way to Zahora by way of a predominantly Euboean conduit, for the ancient written sources describe the 8th century settlements on Euboea as leaders in the maritime expeditions that crossed the Aegean, especially northwards. This, though, does not mean that only Euboeans travelled on these ventures, nor that the sea lanes were the preserves of Euboean vessels alone. Others, too, may have initiated voyages. 
Given the close links between Zagora and various contemporary Euban sites, there is no reason not to posit that some Zagoreans could also have actively participated in voyages that took place in what is now referred to by some researchers as the Euban network or circuit. The material I have presented is only a representative sample of what has been excavated at Zahora. For the latter part of the settlement's existence, I have focused on Euban and Cycladic wares, though it must be remembered that Attic imports continued and were a major component in Zagoras' assemblage, and that Corinthian imports too have been identified, but not in similar numbers. The fine wares clearly place the Zagoreans in a zone of interconnectivity, which is strongly focused on the northern Cyclades, Euboea, Boeotia and Attica. This conclusion is largely reinforced by the decorated neck pithoi studied by Beatrice McLaughlin, which I mentioned earlier, and I show sections and a drawing of one such pithos excavated in our recent campaigns. And there are, of course, other artefacts, such as glass triangular beads, scarabs and metal items of adornment, and a rock crystal prism that testify to the Zagoraeans' connections to networks that spanned a wider world that ranged from the northern Aegean to Crete and from Rhodes and Ionia in the east to central Italy in the west. Life, as it was led, is also evidenced by items such as knives and blades, spindle whirls and loom weights, a reminder of the existence of organic equipment, looms in this case, which are not preserved in the archaeological record. And there's a whole host of material that falls into this category, um, including clothing, basketry and the like. Similarly, recently initiated scientific analyses, such as residue analyses of vessels, will offer us, when completed, insights into questions relating to food production and storage, and a soon-to-be-completed PhD thesis, which has applied isotopic analysis to the excavated animal bones, will provide new information on anim animal husbandry practices at Zahora, an important part of the economy, and a recently completed thesis has opened new vistas on the working of iron at the site. We have seen that the material from Zagora testifies to the settlement's particular participation in a regional entity that primarily encompassed Euboean centers, the northern and central Cyclades, and Attica. Within this region, mariners and others who traveled on their vessels frequently plied the seas. Mobile agents that kept the communities in varying degrees of contact with each other. This connectivity, along with the natural resources of Andros, must have been an important factor in Zawara's development. The sense of place of the settlement's inhabitants would have, to a large degree, been determined by it. Who called in from beyond and whom they could visit, and possibly beyond that where their contacts of their contacts could lead. The regional entity, which can be posited on the basis of Zawara's major classes of fine web imports, is only a first step in a potentially far wider world which the Zagoreans may have had access to, either physically or by hearsay. It is more than likely that the establishment of settlements by Andros on the northern coast of the Aegean in the 7th century, a generation or two after Zagora's abandonment, owes a great deal to processes which are testified to by the importation of, its cer of ceramics and other artefacts to Zagora during the 8th century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stavros. Um, what a wonderful <coughs> way to kick off our lunchtime series uh, for National Archaeology Week. Um, and of course, in a time when it's not possible to travel to Greece, thank you for taking <laughs> us on a, on a trip. Um, Zagora, of course, has been such a significant site, not just in terms of our understanding of early Iron Age Greece, of all the work being done both through Alexander Cambidoglou's excavations in the 60s and 70s and the more recent project that you're involved with, um, but also such a significant site in the history and development of the way archaeology has been researched and taught here in Australia as well too. So it's been lovely to be able to celebrate it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite you to join us again tomorrow where Professor Annie Clark will be speaking on her research on Groot Island. The rest of the series you can find out more on our website. Um, also to let you know that if anyone is interested at 1.30 in this space, 
Um, we will be featuring a musical performance by the Tiwi Singers. No, it's upstairs, is it? One o'clock. Oh, one o'clock. Cool. Ooh, now. Oh, now. <laughs> so, uh, in which case, feel free to stay, uh, but we are going to have to readjust the seats ever so slightly. I'm sure Stavros would be happy to answer any questions um, that we well, may be outside. Yeah. But otherwise, thank you for joining us. And can you join me again in thanking Stavros? Thank you. Thank you for your attention.